Soul Health Academy. You can help found that organization, but that has a lot of resources that would be useful to you if you want to follow up on some of the things that he's talking about. And as I mentioned yesterday, I feel like Ray is really a national, is a national spokesperson on the critical importance of soil health. So Ray, very pleased to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate that. I, uh, so I'm going to use the mic up there. Yeah, I got to do that right now. You guys notice that I'm really hooked up with a lot of mics. I, this is the most mics I've ever had on, my, on me hooked up. Yeah, they're all hooked up. Can you hear them? Okay. Oh, we. So I don't have to use that one. No, you're good. Okay. Well, let's, for, uh, since I'm being recorded, my name is Jim Garish. <laughs> let's get that right, right off the top of the bat. Now I can say whatever I want there, Jim. Let's start off this way. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, beautiful Kentucky. Thank you for coming. How many here traveled more than three hours to get here? Raise your hand. Oh, bless your heart. I don't know. Do we, we need to pay you something? I'm, I'm sure UK will write you a check. Thank you so much for coming. How many, um, how many crop people? Raise your hand, please. How many are integrating crop with their grazing systems? Oh, fantastic. How many grazers? Beautiful. How many raise hair sheep? How about wool sheep? How about goats? How about cattle, of course? Oh, wow, cattle. You know, my neighbor said when I first brought hair sheep into the, my local area, he said, um, Ray, are you an idiot? This is cattle country. And I said, uh, where's the sign? I don't see no sign. So uh, I'm glad that you all came. I'm going to tell you one thing I've learned through traveling the whole country, parts of Canada, Mexico. If people are really interested in learning, they'll do two things. They'll separate themselves from money, and they'll give the most precious thing, time. So thank every one of you for coming, and I really appreciate that. Let me tell you real quick why. Yes. Yep. Which one? This one right here. I'm going to be careful where I. Yeah. He goes. Hey. 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 Is that one working? Hello? They can, you, you guys can hear me, right? They can hear me. So you're good? C can you hear the recording? Can you? Is it coming through the speaker? No. Uh, Levi, you should know better how to do this. <laughs> Man, I feel like, did you see how many of them? I'm going to pull out another one. That's it. There you go. Okay. There we go. There we go. I'm all, ah. Okay, let's. I got a lot to cover, but let me let me sh let me share something really important with you, and why I I'm able to speak in front of you. The reason I'm being able to here to speak in front of you because, for the first 15 years of my career, I failed as a conservationist. I'm just being brutally honest, and I started off with soil. It used to be called soil erosion service, soil conservation service, and then became natural resource conservation service. It was about 17, 18 years ago, I said, something is absolutely going wrong in agriculture. I could not put my finger. It was an, actually an organ. And I saw that farmers were going broke and could not bring their son and daughter into the operation. I, it bothered me. Because remember, I was, part of the little, I was part of the agriculture community there. I had 11 acres. And it just absolutely frustrated me to see that why the son or daughter couldn't come into the operation. And they owned 500 prime acres in Idaho. A lot of water, great soil. And the second thing that just kind of really bothered me was every time irrigation season um, happened, that little beautiful green river, the Snake River, turned to chocolate right on my border. That really bothered me. In fact, it was so bad that the Brownlee Reservoir was being filled with sediment. And that year, one of the years, a couple of dogs died because of an algal bloom. And the last thing is that really bothered me was the 
Here I went to eight years of university study, and I did not know the goal. I did not know the goal. And the goal, I mean, what do I mean by that? What the goal I learned was this. My job as an agronomist, a soil scientist, was about production. It was about yield. How to make sure that you weren't going to go broke, and I was going to use the, the tools of tillage, fertilizer, chemical, pesticides. I was going to dominate, and I was going to force nature to do her business. How many were taught that way? Every one of us should probably raise their hand, except the very few. How many were taught this? How many were taught by your grandparent, your parent, or somebody, a mentor, or somebody that say, you know, if you're going to get in agriculture, your job is to emulate it, follow the design, love it, nurture it, understand it, careful how you work with it. How many were taught that? Very few. Today, what we're going to learn, and I'm going to share with you, is the framework. And it seems to be the most common pattern I see all over the country as I teach. I want you to walk away with four basic concepts that are so critical. We're going to talk about biology. We're going to talk about a lot of these things. But the first one is connectness. How powerful is connectness? If you do not understand connectness, you, like my friend John Graham from Kentucky said, Ray, you're a ball lost in tall weeds. You don't understand connectness. You have a very hard time understanding what the implications are when you go out there and you spray or you overgraze. You don't understand the implications because you do not understand that everything is connected on that farm. We're connected, whether you realize it or not. It's a collective whole. Number two, the soil is absolutely alive. It is absolutely shocking what I have learned that I really did not understand that the soil runs on intelligent design. It is the most complex ecosystem on the planet. It is alive. And our schools are still teaching. It's a growing medium. Number three, the goal. There's nothing more frustrating in not knowing the goal. And I'm going to tell you, I started to hate agriculture when I, was, when I told you I had that epiphany. Because I did not know the goal. The goal is not to make money, folks. That is the outcome. The goal is for you to emulate the natural design. Not mimic the neighbor. Mimic intelligent design. And the last one, and probably just as powerful, is mindset. Mindset is everything. Well, let's start down the journey. To show you that the connectness, people back then, way back, even before Benjamin Franklin, knew that things were connected. This is a, not a new concept, but it seems to be a new concept in our modern society. Let me, let me read it to you. Benjamin Franklin said, a little neglect may breed great mischief. But what was he talking about? For, what was he talking about? He was talking about this. This is the parable. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the war was lost. All because the loss of a nail. What does that mean? One tiny thing can change a total, have an incredible outcome. One little nail lost the whole kingdom. Because the messenger couldn't get there and give the message and the battle was lost and the kingdom was lost. Folks, the people you married, the, the person you married, was like that little nail. It had an incredible, out, uh, a, a total change in your life. Me marrying my wife, I could not do what I do if I didn't have an incredible wife taking care of the, taking care of the farm. Sixth grade, when I went to the right school, I went to a private school, changed my life. All of you have had those little tiny nails, those little butterfly effects that have changed your life. Does it matter if I move the cows one more time? Does it matter if I overgraze? Does it matter if I cover that, that soil? It matters. It's that little nail that can make a huge outcome. Case in point, 
there's a great book I definitely recommend. It's called Chaos. So fascinating because really the concept of the butterfly effect came into the 1963 by this man called Edward Norton Lorenz. What that little parable I just read to you was really talking about quantum mechanics, quantum entanglement. Edward Lorenz, brilliant mathematician, great meteorologist. This is what happened. He's the one that coined the butterfly effect. Butterfly effect means this. Can the flappings of the wings of a butterfly, moving the air molecules under its wing, can it create a tornado in Kansas? And the answer is yes. Little tiny things in nature can make a huge outcome. How do you stumble across it? Those were the computers at that time. So he had 12 parameters in the computer. And he was crunching away, and all of a sudden the computer went down. He says, I'm running out. So he ran out of time, and he says, he's getting a cup of coffee. And he says, well, look, I'll just, that computer was set for eight decimals. In other words, if he read the weather, it would be 98.6732. It was detailed right down to it. And what was he trying to do? He was measuring. He, he, the model was running all kinds of 12 parameters to try to predict the weather. So when the printer went out, I mean, when the computer went out, he said, well, I'll just go ahead and put it to three decimals. Would one, would one part in a 1,000 make a difference? He said it wouldn't make a difference in the prediction of the weather. To his astonishment, it did. That one part in a 1,000 change the outcome, whether we're going to get rain or sun. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why today we have to use satellites, and they have to run copious amounts of models to predict the weather, to get even close. After three days, I don't even bother listening to the weather. Dr. Lorenz said, if you got all the sensors on the planet and corrected all their errors, used a supercomputer, oh, by the, by the way, the sensors covered every square foot and were the height of Mount Everest, you would still not predict the weather. Why am I sharing this with you? Farming and ranching is the most complex job in the world. And I hear farmers I say, I'm just a farmer or a rancher. Folks, going to the moon is easy. Try and make a living off a farm and ranch that changes daily with millions of species interfacing with each other daily. You have the most complex job on the planet. And we have treated it like it's you just have to plant a seed. That is ridiculous. This is my college education. By the way, it's our high school education. It started since we were high school. Here's what's happened, folks. The older generations, like, for example, Middle East generations, uh, Middle East cultures, they understand holism. We, in modern Greek, Roman, Western cultures, we learned reductionism. What does that mean? We reduce everything into little parts. When I went to college, chemistry here, biochemistry here, and then you would take ecology here, agronomy here, soils here. Not one professor said, now let's get all this education and put it together as a collective whole. Biblical cultures, they saw things in holes. Native Americans saw holes. The best book I ever read to help me see things in holes was Alan Savory's book on holistic management. It peeled all the fragmentation away. Folks, I learned to look at the tire, the engine. Isn't it similar when we go to the doctor? What does the doctor do? Send you to the, to the lung specialist, takes you to the ear specialist, takes you to the no specialist. We break you up into pieces, and rarely do you go back and say, well, how does it work together as a whole? We missed it. I missed it. We're going to talk to you about the most powerful 
agency on your farm, the microbes. We left them out. We neglected them. So let's talk about some of the most powerful force on the farm is the microbes. Now, there's four things you have to know. This very thing. When I walk on your operation, you know the first four things I look at? Four questions I always ask myself. How much sun am I capturing? How much sun am I capturing? Is my farm and ranch running on new sunlight or ancient sunlight? Ancient sunlight is diesel, fertilizer, propane, gas, natural gas, pesticides, fertilizers, all those are made by ancient sunlight. A majority of our farms and ranches are going broke because our farms are running too much on ancient sunlight. The second thing is the water cycle. Is the water going into the soil? And the third, ecosystem process. Nutrient cycling. If the water does not get in, the microbes swim in water. If the microbes are not happy, they are not going to cycle nutrients on your operation, period. That's how your cow and your plant get nutrients, through the microbial herd. And the last one, diversity. How many of you have a cell phone? Right? That cell phone you got right there is a piece of plastic and chip and metal without the software. It is worthless. Your farm software is biology, insects, life, animals. It runs on that. So when I walk on your operation, you know the first thing I want to hear? Insects. I want to hear beauty and see beauty. If I don't, your software has got a bug in it. You. We're the virus. They're messing up the software. It's the way we think. So here's the thing. Now, number one thing, you got to get the concept. Plant and soil are one. If I take the plant out, I can't feed the biology. If I don't have soil biology, if I don't have plant, guess what I have? Geology. Sand, silt, and clay. You know what the first thing farmers tell me when I come to the, uh, I come to the operation? Ray, you don't understand. This is Kentucky. Kentucky is different from Missouri. Really? You mean you're in Mars? You don't have biology? That's the first thing farmers tell me. I don't care if you're in Canada. I don't care if you're in Hawaii. That's the first thing you say. You don't understand, Ray. Our soils are different. No, they're not. They may have different geology, but they're driven by biology. Okay? Now, important concept. 40% of our rain comes from plants evapotranspiring. The 60% comes from the ocean. If we're denuding our planet and taking the vegetation, the ones that bring the rain, do you think we might be having a problem? How many of you get the rain steadily? If you do, I want to talk to you personally. <laughs> rain comes from plants evapotranspiring. Does it matter how you graze? Does it affect the small water cycle? Yes. Does it matter if you cover the soil at the end of the year? Yes. It impacts the rain. They bring the rain. Now, here's the issue right off the top of the bat. I created the soil, the slide, and it goes like this. The soils are naked because it doesn't have its natural covering, the plant. They're hungry because it's the plant that feeds the soil microbes. The ancient people used to call it the mouth of the soil. And they're thirsty because the water is not going in because the plants create aggregates that allow the water to infiltrate. Plants and microbes do that together. And they're running a fever because the plants help cool the soil surface. And so what's happening is we have a lot of sensible and latent heat going off into the atmosphere, pushing the rain clouds away. And we hear global warming, global warming, CO2, CO2, but the real problem is global ignorance, global disconnectness. Our people are disconnected from the land. The only reason I came up with this concept 
is I'm not smarter than a fifth grader. We make it too complex. What if we covered the soil and there was no more, no more bare ground if you drive from California all the way to North Carolina and in the fall and the spring it is green? Would it change the climate? Yes, it would. This, take a picture of that. It's a great article called Scientific American. If those who want to learn about what's going on, we have too much water vapor in the climate. The water vapor should be in the plant and the soil. We've been blaming CO2. So when we get rain, sometimes you'll get 10 inches. Remember what happened in St. Louis? 10 inches all at one time. That's not normal, folks. The climate can no longer regulate itself. Why am I saying this to you? Because it's driven by the microbes and the plants. The planet is connected. And then this is what happens. Do you know what the solution is, some people say? Let's build bigger dikes. What if we just covered the soil? Remember the fire that was blamed in California? People said, well, it was the, the Forest Service. They did that. What if it's the way we farm and ranch in the country? Does it matter the way we farm and ranch, and does it affect our climate in California? The answer is yes, it does. It matters. You matter. That's what's so exciting about it. Now, how many of you, let me ask you, how many would give up your car? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. How many would give up the air conditioning? I didn't think so. Now, we're not, we're not going to ask our Amish brothers and sisters. They're more resilient. But how many would agree if we as a country supported agriculture to cover the land? I would. Because I want this thing solved quickly. I'm an impatient man. I drive this country and I see where we're at. The solution is simple. But try to get people to understand and work together is a different thing. Now, here's the first thing you're going to need to do. Pull out a shovel. How many use a shovel on a regular basis to talk to your soil? I, there's a couple of you. I hope you start looking at the, using this powerful tool. Let's see how I look at it. This is what I do. First thing I do, farmers tell me, about Ray, I'm a really good farmer. I said, really? I said, well, let's go to your fence row. Let me go to the wooded area and just look at your cropland. I'm going to compare you with nature. She's the standard. Nature, the fence roll, you're farming. Just by that, one day I had this in Wisconsin, I was able to convince a farmer to go to no-till covers just with a shovel full in 20 minutes. Look at the difference. The wooded and years and years of farming. Tobacco, cotton, look at the difference. What does nature do and the way we do business? What is going on? And we'll talk about that in a second. OK, first thing everybody needs to understand, soil has order. It has a design. And here's the design. Now, I don't want you to remember all these names, but I'm going to give you a simple name, OK? First is the phylosphere. Everybody's going to remember that one, right? Phylo. Phylo means the surface of the plant. A living plant has microbes on the surface. They're called epiphytes. What do those microbes do on the surface of the plant? Do you know how I found out about this, about these phylosphere? I read an article that a dairy guy went out there and he sprayed raw milk Pastor raw milk on the surface of the plant. And he increased his yield by 10 bushel. And I said, what? I said, now hold on a second. If the, if the milk lands on the ground, the microbes will just consume it. And I say, I don't know how that's going to work. But beknownst to me, I started looking in the literature. And there's a conference where they call the Phylosphere Conference. Can you imagine? Everybody in that conference wears really thick glasses, and they look at the plant. No, I'm just kidding. 
I would nerd out on that one. That would be so much fun. OK, so those epiphytes, those bacteria that live on the surface, they increase and they have something to do with the metabolic function of the plant. Guess what? All of you have bacteria all over your body. 90% of you is bacteria. So if somebody calls you a dirt bag, don't take it personally. You're dirt on legs. Folks, they're finding out the majority of us is bacteria. Only 10% is you. What did people start doing during the COVID? They started cleaning their hands and killing the bacteria on the surface of their, of their, of their hands. The bacteria are protective. They serve a purpose. Second one we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the drillosphere. That's about the earthworms. Aggregate, that's to chocolate cake. I want to see chocolate cake, those BBs. The root, the porous sphere. Notice they're called spheres, areas of influence. They overlap each other. That's the design. I pull out a shovel, and I want to see all those spheres present. They all have to be there. Why? If they're not present, you're not going to receive the water cycle properly. You are not going to nutrient cycle properly. All of them need to be present. Let me just talk about it some more. Let's talk about the phylosphere. I already told you, these are these organisms that live on the surface of the plant. Extremely critical for metabolic process. Who would have thought on the surface of the plant and in the bottom of the root, you got bacteria? We know now that plants are carnivores. They suck up bacteria that's called rhizophagy, roots eating. We know there's another nitrogen source of how plants pick up nitrogen. They actually strip the outer shell of the bacteria, according to Dr. James White. Write him down, Dr. James White at Rutgers. Go watch his YouTubes. They're cool. Now, let's go to the rhizosphere. This is the reason why a lot of us are going broke on the operation, or we're losing money, or not making money. Right here, that is a root leaking liquid sun. Hundreds of molecules leaking and feeding the micro herd. They feed the micro herd. So the more you have canopy on the top, and the more you manage your grasses, the more you leak sugars but also grazing stimulates it. That's why cover crops are not optional. They are not optional. You all eat every day. How much of this are we doing on a corn and soybean guy? How, much, how many days of sunlight are they capturing? About 120 days. Last time I looked, we get sun for 365 days. You eat every day. How many of you would stop have feeding your kids? Oh, you only eat for 120 days, kids. You starve for the rest of the day, rest of the year. That's what we're doing to our soils. Why? It's these guys, folks. They're the ones that make zinc available. Them and fungi, they make the minerals available. They balance the soil. They make the organic matter. They make the aggregates. They do. They're the ones that feed the plant and feed your cow. The more you're healthy your soils, the less mineral you buy. The less mineral you buy. They're the ones that excrete powerful enzymes and bring it out of the rock. They do that. If they're not happy, nobody's happy. And then you write another check. That's the nutrient cycle. Now notice in grass systems, in the prairies, look at the grass, look at the ultimate failure of our current cropping systems. Look at all the bare ground and look at corn. And look at our system here. For the whole part of the year, you have a lot of the soil that's not being fed with your corn crop during the whole season. But the moment you come up with a cover crop at the end of the year with a root system like that, man, you're feeding microbes again. And you start the healing process. This picture I absolutely love. Because this shows exactly where we are as a country in our grazing systems.
When I drove all the way from Missouri, all the way to Kentucky, this is what I saw. Rarely did I see a pastor that looked like this. Which one is feeding microbes? Which ones are cycling and capturing the sun and the water and doing all the ecosystem processes more effectively? Right here. It matters how you move those animals. This, this is a typical site. Oops. This is the norm. Is that affecting our climate? Yes. Is it affecting our water cycle? Yes. Is it affecting our nutrient cycle? Yes. It matters how you do it. I was born in 1961. This is the Hornada Research Station where I went to college at New Mexico State. 61. This is what I saw in college. 61. Now. And it's not just New Mexico. It's Colorado. It's Nevada. It's the whole West looks like that. It is becoming desertified, folks. And it's happening under our watch. And what's the first thing people blame? The cows. It's not the cow. It's the how. I tell people, I tell environmentalists, we are not going to be able to heal the planet without cows. It's the only way we're going to restore the whole massive landscape. Folks, right now, we, these, I really believe that a majority of the land was once covered. Scientists have shown that. Saudi Arabia was covered. That now we're becoming more and more desertified throughout the planet. 70% of our planet is water. 30% is land. Over 20 to 29% of the ground is bare ground like this, folks. Is that affecting the climate? I say yes. Again, now let's go to the next order. Aggregates, one of my favorite. First thing I look on your farm, if I'm working on a corn and soybean guy, or conventional or organic, I pull out the shovel and I want to see aggregates. That's an aggregate. An aggregate is the fusion of sand, silts, and clays to create little BBs, to create chocolate cake. That's what filtrates. Those aggregates last 27 days. It's like a living, dynamic skin. If you do not have roots and microbes doing that, you have no infiltration. None. Very little. That's why the water ponds up to the top. Now look at this. Let's see if we got the next video. Okay, now this is a picture of the avulii, the air sacs in your lung. Isn't that incredible? Fungi and little hair roots all wrap around to hold the sand and clay particles. Very similar like your lung. Do you know why your lung was designed that way? The oxygen, the gas exchange is incredible. Same thing with an aggregate. Without this, there is no gas exchange of oxygen and, and um, CO2 and water. Very cool. This is a 50-year no-till field. How many do no-till? Love no-till. Why do I love no-till? You do not destroy the house. Great concept, but we forgot something really important. We forgot to cover it. Who cares if you protect the house if you're starving to death? Look what happens with three years of covers, folks. Three years of covers went from here to here. A lot of people went back to tilling in, in, in no-till fields because the soil was becoming compact. There was stratification. And I wouldn't listen to it. I wasn't being sincere and honest to myself. And then I realized, we're missing the most important part, the covers. When I work with somebody wanting to go to no-till, do you know the first thing I tell them? Let's start with covers. Then we'll work you into no-till. I like to do them together. Then we don't have a failure. Those no-tillers, I give you so much credit because you had to go to five years of misery trying to get that system to work for you. You remember that? Those first transition years? They weren't easy, depending on your soil. Now, I have a question to ask. Now, are you ready for the... 
the slate there. This is a, this is a great way to show aggregate stability. Aggregate stability is this, folks. When I pour water, or if water, if a clod is put together, now remember, a clod is a system of aggregates. What does that mean? Millions of aggregates together. Soils are really aggregation. Little tiny beads to that whole soil profile. That's the structure. Now, if you want to know if your soil is, is, has good aggregate stability, this is a great demonstration. I'm going to show you the video. Now, keep in mind, this video was pulled off the USDA website. See if you can catch the words or cause people to get too upset in that little three minute video to show aggregate stability. Now, what we're going to see is I'm going to be pouring two clods, putting two clods in the tube. We want to see which soil holds together. If the soil falls apart, it has poor aggregate stability. We want a soil that holds its integrity. When water rushes in to fill the millions of pore spaces, we want to see which soil holds together. Let's see what happens. I have a question to ask you. Is your soil healthy, functioning, and stable? One of the best diagnostic tools that I know of is the soil stability test. Here are two soils, exactly the same soil type. This soil has been tilled for 30 years. It is addicted to chemicals and fertilizer. This soil has not been tilled for 40 years. It is covered year round with diverse plants. It is completely weaned from chemicals and fertilizer. Watch what happens when we drop the soil in the water. Notice how the conventional till soil is falling apart. The biotic glues in the organic matter are burned up by tillage. The soil pores have collapsed. Notice the no-till soil. The soil is holding together. The pore spaces are still intact. Do this test for yourself. I guarantee if you dig a little, you'll learn a lot. Now, this is Ray Steyer's field in North Carolina, 6.5% organic. He out, um, the forest in his farm was 3%. He was 6.5%. He rolled cover since the 80s. It was his slides that I took all over that got this movement of cereal rye being rolled. It was Ray Steyer's. This farm is a mile apart. These are Piedmont soils. This one is a farm a mile apart. They do old massive tillage, no covers. Vegetable farm, just a mile apart, same soil types. So when you have the clays and the silts dispersed in the water, that means it'll plug the pores. And the water will stand up, and the water will not get in, and you will not capitalize in your, in your infiltration. This soil is leaky. You'll, it, this is addicted to fertilizer and chemicals. What was the term? They got that video kicked out. Addiction. My professor was mad. He says, Ray, why did you use that word? I use it on purpose. The English dictionary for addiction means cannot function without the substance. Healthy soils should not respond to chemical fertilizer. I'll say that again. Healthy soils will not respond to nitrogen fertilizer. Why is that? They're cycling on their own. They don't need it. Difficult to realize now the this, difference in rainfall. This one here. Now, this is the two demonstrations that have created this movement, folks. The next one is the rain simulator, and I'm going to show it on the grazing system. You ready? Okay, so what you can see JB Daniels from Virginia. It's these demonstrations. This is the two demonstrations I use to reach the most compacted surface on the farm between the years. I cannot even talk to you or have a conversation until we see these two demonstrations. Let's see what happens. Now, when we do this, Chris, I want you to do is I want you to remember how I paused it yesterday? I'll tell you when to. Remember that? No, I don't. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll, I'll tell you when to stop it. Ready? Difficult to realize that
difference in rainfall runoff between a continuously grazed pasture versus a rotationally grazed pasture. To really see the difference, you actually have to be out there during the heaviest thunderstorm of the year. NRCS uses a rainfall simulator to demonstrate the effects of infiltration versus runoff on pasture surfaces. These pasture samples were collected from actual pastures just down the road from each other. One represents continuous overstocked and overgrazed pasture. The other represents a rotationally grazed and rested pasture. All rainfall runoff is funneled into a collection jug on the front of the demonstration table. This allows us to visually compare both the volume and clarity of the runoff. Most important nutrient we have to manage is water. Uh, with rotational grazing, particularly during the summer, we have more water infiltration because we have a better cover on the ground. Essentially, the cover intercepts the water particle and allows it to enter into the ground versus running off. By the end of the demonstration, it's amazing to see how much more runoff occurs on the continuous overgrazed pasture versus the well-rested, rotationally grazed pasture. Discharge measure infiltration. Keep going. Just one more. A little bit more. Touch. Yeah, there we go. Here you can see how much more water actually soaks in and absorbed under the rotationally grazed, well-rested pasture and how much more water actually runs off the continuous grazed pasture. Okay, class. Why is there so much runoff here? Now, before you answer, make sure we explain when you till the soil, you infuse oxygen, and you wake up bacteria, and they catabolize and eat the aggregates, they eat the organic matter. When you till, you wake up bacteria. Why does the soil do that? I believe it's a protective mechanism. When the bacteria consume part of the carbon, they die, they release nitrogen, and then the weeds come up. So there's two things. I think it's to help the healers come up. So the soils are saying, I gotta protect myself, I gotta bring in the weeds. They die, they consume carbon, they release nitrogen. So think about what you're doing when you're tilling. Not only are you destroying carbon, your aggregates and your infiltration, you're sending nitrogen into the system, and then weeds are stimulated. It stimulates weeds. It's designed that way. Now, there's no tillage here, folks. Why is there so much runoff and so little infiltration? No, nope, I'm not gonna ask you, because you were yesterday. What do you think, guys? You guys are awake, you guys all came, come on. No aggregates. Folks, do you know what the majority of people say? Well, the, the plant canopy is not tall enough. It's compacted. Number one thing people say is compaction, right? Because you got animals, you compacted it. That, those are all true, but you know what the number one thing? Aggregates, when you say organic matter, aggregates. The organic matter is infused in the aggregates. That's why you really don't like the word organic matter. It's too generic. Organic matter should really be thinking of it as it's biotic substances created by life and death and these super molecules embedded into the geology and on top of the surface and inside the particles. Say it all at one time. Organic matter is more elegant than we ever given it imagine, folks. Organic matter is not just this fluffy material on the top of the surface. It's more than that. This is why hay fields will run off. Continual haying and no recovery, no grazing will run off just like that. Soybean fields will run off. Why does soybean so hard on the soil? Because they leak nitrogen and microbes go, ooh, free nitrogen, I'm going to eat the aggregate. Soils are always eating, folks. That's why when after soybean, I put a cover crop. I do not leave the ground bare. Alfalfa is the hardest soil ever to collect those demonstrations. Why? One root, leaking nitrogen, not feeding carbon, and you remove the biomass, the ground gets hard like rock. 
How do you fix it? Fibrous root system. Now, let's go to the next one. The porosphere. I just talked about it. No aggregates, no pores. It's just as simple as that. No aggregates, no pores. Microbes live in those pores. Again, to remind you, they swim in those pores. So if the pores are collapsed, you affect their home. It really does matter, again, how you do business. And your rotations, they matter. Notice this right here. Rotational grazing, these are taken in the soil, done by NRCS in, in South Dakota. Continuous grazing, this is continuous grazing. This is cropland. How does it affect the aggregation and the infiltration? Cropland, half an inch per hour. If you get two inches of rain, you can't capitalize on it. Continuous rotation, 2.1 inches of infiltration. In other words, if you let the cows do whatever they want, hey, I'll see you in a week. Bye. Rotation, 12.4 inches of water. Is it possible that we create our own droughts? I think so. How about hayland? Look at the infiltration on hayland. 0.59 inches. Look at the range. 27 inches. Don't get me wrong, rangeland, if it's not managed properly, well, uh, 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 yeah, I better, I better speed up. Okay, so let's go. So please understand, now the next one is the, the skin of the soil. Now, this is incredibly important. One of my favorite parts is the skin. So we want living plants. We want roots. We want earthworms. We want cottage cheese. And I want skin. Look at all the organisms that are connected together. This is the nutrient cycle, folks. On the top of the surface, that first inch, if you mess up that first inch, you mess up the whole cycle. People say, well, Ray, don't you want to dig a pit so we can show them? I said, if I don't get the first inch right, I don't care about the next seven feet. That first inch is critical. Why? Because it's the life that drives it. Look at that system. How incredible. Beautiful. Does it matter to have skin? Look, it does matter. Look at the temperature. That skin suppresses weeds. It feeds the microbes. It keeps the plant cool, the soil cool. Does it matter if you have skin, if you roll the cover crop? No skin, skin. No till, no till. No till without cover crops, no till with covers. Again, that cover. Now we'll go to the next one, the drillosphere. This is amazing. Earthworms, these organisms, a healthy soil should have 20 earthworms per cubic foot. 20 earthworms per cubic foot, write it down. Go take it in the spring. This soil is so healthy, if a farmer, the farmer that goes out there, he carries a small gun to make sure he's not taken down by the earthworms. Man, that is a dangerous place. Look at that. If you have a residue problem, you have a management problem. First thing I, when I tell people in the grazing system, you need to mob the animals closer. There's no nutrient cycling. Or if you have a problem with your crop field, cover crops. Now we're gonna skip here because of time. Again, now what's the problem? Right here, excessive tillage, excessive haying, too much pesticides, too much fertilizer. Did I say not to do any of that? I didn't say that. Careful with your tools. If you do excessive tillage, you hurt the mycorrhizae, you hurt the springtails, you hurt the rest of the predators, and the whole system collapses. Then you write another check. This is the problem. The power of connectness, understanding why everything you need to be very careful how you do business. This is not the nutrient cycle, folks. We have farmers thinking that's normal. Fertilizer has only been used since the 1950s. Healthy soils will not respond to this. This is a salt. It can lower the pH. It's got issues. 
careful with it. Okay, because of time, we're going to skip here. Now, right here, folks, mimic nature. We're trying to mimic nature. She's covered all the time. She doesn't till. She has animals. She's got a skin. Both systems have that. Fact, mimic nature was in the Bible. Ask the beast, they will tell you. Follow the design. We're doing cover crops that look like this. That's what we're doing on millions of acres now. Farmers, what, what do people think that is? People, most people think, when I did this in organic, oh, it's a cancer machine. Oh, no. That sprayer spreads, puts cover crop seed on standing corn. Look at this. Farmers designed that for this. So the ground is fed after, the whole, after you get your corn out, once you get your soybean out. We are doing this on a national scale. Rolling covers and finding corn on your soybean and tomato everywhere. Look at the cotton. Skin like the forest. Look at the design. It's there intact. Look at the design. The skin is present. We're doing it on tomatoes. We're doing it on pumpkins. Look at Las Cruces. This is where I went to college. I grew up here. This is the way my professors told me how to raise pecans. Irrigate it. Why did they teach me that? Anybody? Leave the ground bare between them. Why? Competition. It's going to steal water. It's going to steal nutrients. This is the way we do it now. Now we stabilize the yields. Now we have beneficial insects. No more insecticide. No more fungicides. No more nitrogen fertilizer. They're feeding each other with a microbial herd and talking to each other. Now we're wrapping it up here. How about the grazing? Biomimicry. We are teaching farmers and ranchers to emulate the design. Chihuahuan Desert. I went to college here, four hours south. How hot is it? Oh, it's hot. You drop an egg on the, on the, uh, in the summer, on the sidewalk, it will fry. We don't know what heat is here. Even Louisiana doesn't know what heat is. This is hot. They only get 6 to 11 inches. This is La Dama's ranch, 25,000 acres. Alejandro Carrillos is a rancher, and he will be in the next Kiss the Ground movie called um, Common Ground. What do we all have in common? Alan Savory. You know what Alan Savory taught me? Holism. That's what he taught me. Look at things in holes. Look at the Chihuahuan Desert before. It was a grassland. This, it is, this, this is how it looks now. If you drive from Albuquerque all the way to, the, to Alejandro's Ranch, millions of acres look like that. This is the problem in the whole West and the majority of our planet. Now look how Alejandro changed it. Infrastructure, long rest periods, moving the cows with one herd. Context, context, context. And Jim's going to talk to you about more context. Context, the way you manage your animals, the way you do things, but there's a common pattern we all have. We have to be able to Regulate the movement of the animals. We got it to and mimic the, the system of nature. Look at the drinking troughs they put. They designed that on their own. They get no government cost share. Look at the fence to separate the paddocks. One wire, one hot wire on over 25,000 uh, uh, 25, acre ranch. They move polywire up them ridges. I can't even get a farmer here to move, a rancher to move the cows one more time. It's too much work. Look at their equipment. Now, how is he fixing this? Pretty simple. I love this research paper called Mobile Link Organisms and Ecosystem Functioning, Implications for Ecosystem Resilience and Management. You can find that paper in, on the line. So here, here it works. You take a good part of the ranch, a support area, and then you move them to the disturbed site. Bats do this. Bees do this. Life does that. Cows 
Cows are nutrient uh, processors. So you move the cows from a good part of the ranch into the part of the ranch that needs to be healed. Look what the cattle bring on the face. Seed in their poop and on their skin. Look how well adapted those cattle are. They had moved their animals from a big animal to a smaller animal, and Jim can talk about that later. So here's what we're doing. Moving the animals from here to here, and we're moving them during the rainy season. Landscaping, okay? And this is how they do it. They got two Tawamara cowboys. They move the cows 800 times a year, twice a day. That's all they do. That's all they do. But they're watching. They're observing. Over there, you have to move them frequently because the sun is so intense, it destroys the forage. Photo degradation. So they have to be watching. They're observers. All of them have learned to be observers. Look how they move the cows. We took that drone footage. They're so happy to move. You know, the good Lord made even a safety switch for the cows when they go, move me. It's pretty simple. Move me. Now look at this right here. Two cowboys moving that whole herd of five, 600. All one herd. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? They're so happy. Look how fast they do it. Well, I, I, speed up. I speeded it up. Look how they move. It's amazing. Kind of like, and then go to the water holes. Now, what they've done is taken an area that used to take 250 acres to support one cow. Alejandro's now 20 acres to support one cow. He's got it right here. Initial condition of Alejandro's ranch in 2006, 2015. And Alejandro told me he didn't really start getting really serious until this time. But he started in 2006. But look at this now. I took that picture. No seed planted. None planted. It was animal movement. The seed bank was there. Stimulation with microbes, poop, urine, breaking the compaction with the hoofs, and it started the system again. This was taken this year. Look at that. And I was taught in range school, this cannot happen. Resilience built on animal impact, long rest periods, and adaptive genetics. These are my sheep. We're almost done, two or three. Ray, I'm almost there. These are my sheep during a severe drought. Look how they ate the buck brush. You know what the typical thing would do? I hate, most everybody around me hate. During the drought, it was that, the grass was that tall. I let mine get gnarly and tall because I wanted to protect my soil. So I look at my fescue, brown, but the things that were green. So a weed is not a, a plant that's out of place. A weed is not a plant out of a place. A weed is this, folks. It is a plant. I still do not understand its function. Because the moment you call one plant good and bad, you are lost. Creator said it was all very good. We still don't understand its purpose. Last slide. Alejandro's ranch getting rain. The neighbor's ranch not getting rain. <laughs> There's the alarm from his, from his iPhone. The ranch is getting, can we change the climate? Yes, we can. The butterfly effect. Last slide, and Ray's saying, thank goodness, he's got the flu. It was an American desert that I suddenly realized that rain does not come from the heavens. It comes from the ground. Desert formation is not due to the absence of rain, but the rain ceases to fall because the vegetation has disappeared. Masanubu Fukuoka. I would buy every book from that man. One of them is called One Straw Revolution. Buy the book. There we go.
What is regenerative agriculture? You hear all kinds of definitions. This is Ray's definition. Regenerative agriculture is a journey for the rest of your life. Do not do this journey by yourself. Work with a community of people. Alejandro has five or 10, 15 people he always works. I have five or 10 people we always share ideas. If you do this by yourself, good luck. Some of you may be 30. That means you may have 50 opportunities. It may take a year or two to see if, this, if the system shifted. I do not allow anybody into my group if they don't think ecologically and they want to mimic nature. They are not allowed in the group. Work together. Do not work by yourself because you will spend the rest of your life figuring it out. Good luck for you. It's the renewal of the human heart and mind, folks. I had to have a complete transformation in the heart and mind to understand that I myself was destroying the planet. It was my thought process. It's the way I looked at things, the way I learned in church, the way I learned in school, the way I learned in the university, the way I learned from my family, the way I, the way I learned from the community. It's called social conditioning. We've all been social conditioned. You remember no-tillers when you first went no-till? How did the people treat you? You're an idiot. You remember when you went to organic? You're an idiot. Social conditioning. Do you think social conditioning happens in the government? I'm a perfect example of that. It's a new way of thinking that loves and emulates nature, folks. Total different thought process. I thank every one of you for coming today. And I hope that you become part of this journey of regeneration. The planet needs you. Your example, the neighbors watch. You don't think they're watching. They are watching. And we can change little communities, and we make a huge impact in healing the planet. So thank you for coming today. It means a lot to me that you drove so far to come to listen to us. Thank you, Ray, so much. Thank you, folks. Thank you.